we get started, uh, I am Wendy Boswick. I'm an associate professor in the Public Health and Health Education Program here at NIU. My research actually is focused on health disparities, uh, but among LGBT populations with a particular focus on bisexual women. Uh, the purpose of today's seminar really is to make explicit some of the tacit practices that undergird the scholarly and um, research inquiry process. And in particular, to highlight how we do interdisciplinarity and how um, we can employ multi-method inquiry in the work that we do, while also acknowledging the challenges, the benefits, the barriers, and the costs associated with such work. We'll be talking about Dr. Majola's uh, research as it relates to her book, uh, Love, Money, and HIV, Becoming a Modern African Woman in the Age of AIDS, which you can tell I've been looking at recently. <laughs> <laughs> this work, if you don't know, is focused on the disproportionately high rate of HIV among young Kenyan women. Dr. Majola's research relies on biomedical, behavioral, social, economic, and ecological perspectives to tell the rich and complex story of how gender, sexuality, and health intersect to fuel the AIDS epidemic among this group of women. So here's Dr. Majola. She received her PhD from the University of Chicago in 2008 in sociology, yes, and is currently an associate professor of sociology at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Presently, however, she is on sabbatical Yay, <laughs> At the W.E.B. Du Bois Research Institute at the Hutchins Center at Harvard University. Her research examines the social and structural processes underlying health disparities in a variety of settings, including Kenya, South Africa, and most recently, and most currently, Washington, D.C. Her current work uses mixed methods to examine gender disparities in HIV rates, as I discussed and the HIV epidemic among African Americans in Washington, D.C. Her methodological specialty is combining qualitative methods, which we'll talk about in a little bit more depth, with quantitative methods to answer research questions. Her work utilizes focus groups, interviews, and survey data, while framing her findings using lenses not just um, from sociology and of sociology, but also public health and epidemiology, culture and gender studies, and the larger historical, political, and economic context of Kenya and the larger African continent. So, with that, um, I'd like to jump in. I'm gonna start with some questions for Dr. Majola. My understanding is that you all are here, uh, not necessarily till the end of our time, is that correct? I'm not sure, because I sprung the Sandra. Okay. So <laughs> we didn't really discuss. I know some people do have other, our class technically ends at 4.45. Okay. So. With the understanding that some of you will have to leave earlier on, I want to ensure that there is a larger dialogue so that you all have the ability to ask questions um, before you take off if you need to leave early. But I'm just gonna get the ball rolling. So, let's start at the beginning. Um, and I only say that partially facetiously. I'm curious to know for you how you came to the work that you're currently doing and what first drew you to this and interested you in the current topic that you're working on. Okay, well, thanks for that introduction. I'm really uh, excited to be here um, with all of you. Um, so uh, I took in my second year of undergrad, I did my undergrad in England. I took a class on the sociology of health and illness. And the professor made the claim that people don't get sick by accident, that it's not random. That in fact, you could predict who was going to get sick, who was going to live longer, who was going to die earlier, based on things like gender, race, ethnicity, where people live, how much education they had. And this was really shocking to me, because I used to think, you know, the flu is random, right? Uh, who gets particular diseases is random, but there's actually a social pattern um, in, in who gets sick and who doesn't. Um, and so coming from the African continent, which had been ravaged by HIV AIDS, um, I thought, well, if we know we, we can predict who's going to get sick, and if there's social reasons why people get sick, then there's social ways in which we can prevent it. Um, and so fast forward a few 
few years in grad school, uh, I came across a paper that said, you know, why do young women have higher rates of HIV compared to young men? Uh, and the rate, HIV rates in the paper were astounding. Um, they found that 30% of young women aged 15 to 19, um, and almost 40% uh, of young women aged 20 to 24 um, in a town called Kisumu were HIV positive. Um, and this was a representative household-based survey. So it was a sort of a really well done survey. And I found these numbers very hard to believe because they were so high. Um, and they were five to six times higher than young men uh, of the same age. So I, I started thinking, you know, is this just unique to this place or is it true in other parts of Africa? So that's when I started looking at other countries, looking at survey data and found that actually in every country for which I could find data, young women had higher rates of HIV compared to young men. And so that's what made me decide to investigate how, uh, why young women were at such high risk mm -hmm. um, for HIV. Good, good, good. And so can you talk a little bit more then about what it meant to be trained as a sociologist? and how sociologists typically go about answering questions. So uh, I, was, I was trained as a demographer, so, so that's somebody who does population studies. Um, and so I started with numbers, scary numbers, right? So I, had to, I started off uh, learning statistics and taking a lot of courses on statistics, um, and I did a lot of survey analysis. And so my initial thought was how I was going to figure out what was going on was by simply doing survey analysis. So as I explained, I looked at all the surveys for which I could find data. Um, and, and so yes, young women had higher rates of HIV compared to young men. But when I started digging deeper into the data, uh, I, I found that all the things that I thought were important were not straightforward. So for example, it turned out that when I looked at education, because most case, in the most cases, people who are more educated have lower rates of disease, right? And this is one, one way of predicting who lives longer than who, even in the US, uh, who, who is less, less likely to get particular kinds of illnesses. Education is a really good predictor. But when it comes to HIV AIDS, in the African context, it's actually reversed. And so in fact, women with the lowest uh, education uh, had the lowest rates of HIV, right? But then it was non-linear. So uh, as we moved up with more education, some women had high rates, some women had low rates. Um, and the same thing with wealth. The wealthiest people in Africa have the highest rates of HIV. So again, usually it's the reverse. <laughs> uh, and so there were all these puzzles in the quantitative data that made me want to actually just you know, go and figure out what are the mechanisms, social mechanisms producing these trends? What is actually going on underneath the numbers in these communities that are making things like education so uh, so confounding? Um, yeah. So it, it sounds like then that you sort of started on the quant side, right? You were more quantitatively oriented, quantitatively trained. Yeah. So what was that moment yeah. when you were like, oh, I think I need to expand yeah. the way that I'm asking this question. And was that scary for you? <laughs> yes, it, it, it was very scary because I had already um, formed a dissertation committee. And most of my committee members were demographers. Um, and I had been proposing a quantitative analysis. But all the preliminary analysis I was doing, I found nothing significant. I found myself going round and round in circles just trying to figure out the relationship between education and HIV. Um, and so I thought maybe there was a problem with the data. Mm -hmm. So I went to the field in uh, Nyanza province, and I went to the different district offices thinking I could get district level data. Um, but I was also there um, uh, somewhat frustrated because the data was not disaggregated by age. So. Uh, in, in the settings that I study, they were not aware that young women were at higher risk for HIV because the, the data they had didn't divide things up by age. Um, and so uh, it was partly those frustrations that led me to think, why don't I do qualitative analysis um, and match it with national demographic and health survey data from, from this area? 
um, and then go back and forth between the national data that existed and the qualitative data to try and figure out what was going on. And so I I'm curious if you experienced any barriers to or challenges um, either specifically from your committee or in a, in a larger sense when you came to that aha moment of the best way for me to answer this question is to do more mixed method work. I, I'm, I'm curious what that process looked like for you. It was, it was very difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a very difficult uh, process um, because I think, especially when you, you've taken several years being trained in a particular methodology, you want to find a research problem that matches <laughs> with that mm -hmm. method. And it's very frustrating when you have a question that you can't answer with a particular method. Mm -hmm. but, but part of this and, and, and part of what I hope um, you, know, you all take away is, is it's good when you let the question drive the method as opposed to the method driving the question. So, uh, and, and, and so it was hard to, you know, I think, convince my committee. Mm -hmm. But in the end, I think they, they, they sort of had confidence that I was able to, I was going to be able to come up with a good dissertation. Mm -hmm. And so they let me sort of go off and, and do my field work. I acquired an anthropologist of my committee. You acquired an anthropologist, <laughs> okay, very good. <laughs> um, and I basically, so I did, I wasn't formally trained in ethnographic field work. Um, I, other than I think I audited half a course mm -hmm. and I got all the required textbooks. Mm -hmm. And then I basically learned as I went Okay. Um, by immersion in the field, and then um, my anthropology uh, uh, mentor would give me advice to look over my field notes, um, and, 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 and I'd also do a lot of um, uh, asking of, of, of different, uh, uh, especially when I got to Kenya, mm -hmm. as, you know, I met with a lot of professors there to ask for their advice uh, on how to, you know, the kinds of questions that were appropriate to ask, some of the ethical issues uh, that were relevant to the setting and so on, that really helped me in crafting a, a project that would that would work. Yeah. Um, yeah, that raises that that makes me want to ask about seventeen more questions, actually. Um, but I, I'm curious if you can expand, in in particular, you know, this notion of field work. Mm -hmm. So it, it sounds like even before you. Um, made the decision to leap into uh, mixed method methodology, pardon me, um, that you were already traveling to Kenya, mm -hmm. that you had already done some of the groundwork uh, just for the quantitative mm -hmm. part of your inquiry. At what point were you at that you decided you, need to go, you needed to go back to do that more ethnographically oriented field work? So I, I, I was somewhat unconventional in the sense that I began my field work and then proposed halfway through. Okay. Um, and so I'd already started, if I recall correctly, doing the survey work mm -hmm. um, ahead of time and reached that frustration point. Okay. Um, and, and I happened, and then I, I, I went home to Kenya, started doing preliminary meetings with um, different uh, professors and um, uh, policy people in the field, uh, and then came back, wrote my proposal, and then returned back to the field. Okay. So the okay. process actually, I'd already started doing initial interviews and, and initial data analysis before okay. I, I did my proposal. Got it. 